Good afternoon and welcome to the 153rd of the COVID calls. This is a daily discussion of the COVID-19 pandemic with a diverse collection of disaster experts. My name is Scott Gabriel Knowles. I'm a historian of disasters at Drexel University in Philadelphia. Today, we will talk about data visualization in the pandemic with Emily Bowe, Shannon Mattern, and Aaron Simmons. Just a reminder, you can catch COVID Calls live every weekday at 5 p.m. Eastern time on YouTube. Just go to the COVID Calls YouTube channel to watch. You can also watch COVID Calls on Facebook Live and on Periscope. You can hear COVID Calls anytime recorded as podcasts on Spotify, iTunes, Podbean, or anywhere you get podcasts. You can also keep up with COVID Calls via Twitter using the handle at US of Disaster or at COVID Calls. Please help spread the word and send suggestions for future guests and future topics, and please feel free to suggest yourself as a future guest. As of today, October 21st, there are 1,127,797 deaths in COVID-19 globally reported by the Johns Hopkins University Coronavirus Resource Center. There are 8,300,451 cases of COVID-19 reported in the United States, up from 8,243,223 reported yesterday. There are now a total of 221,550 deaths reported in the United States from COVID-19, up from 220,649 reported yesterday. Usually on COVID calls, I read an obituary, but today I'd like to read a news story that broke yesterday. It shines even more light on the magnitude of the pandemic in the United States. Headline, the coronavirus pandemic has caused nearly 300,000 more deaths than expected in a typical year by Lenny Bernstein. This was published October 20th in the Washington Post. The coronavirus pandemic has left about 299,000 more people dead in the United States than would be expected in a typical year, two thirds of them from COVID-19 and the rest from other causes, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention reported on Tuesday. The CDC said the novel coronavirus, which causes COVID-19 has taken a disproportionate toll on Latinos and Blacks as previous analyses have noted. But the CDC also found surprisingly that it has struck 25 to 44 year olds very hard their quote unquote excess death rate is up 26.5% over previous years, the largest change for any age group. It's not clear whether that spike is caused by the shift in COVID-19 deaths toward younger people between May and August or deaths from other causes, the CDC said. The number of people dying from this pandemic is higher than we think, said Stephen Wolf, Director Emeritus of the Center on Society and Health at Virginia Commonwealth University, who has conducted independent analyses of excess mortality. This study shows it, others have as well. The United States is in the midst of another sharp increase in coronavirus infections, this one centered in the upper Midwest and Plains states. The seven day rolling average of cases, considered the most accurate barometer, is near 60,000 per day. At least 220,000 people have died of COVID-19 so far, according to data kept by the Washington Post. The new CDC data covers February 1st to October 3rd. Wolf said the total is likely to reach 400,000 by the end of the year. The numbers were assembled by the National Center for Health Statistics, a unit of the CDC. Outside analyses, including some by the Washington Post and researchers at Yale University, have found two main causes for excess deaths. Many probably were the result of COVID-19, although they were not recorded that way on death certificates. Others are probably the result of deaths at home or in nursing homes from heart attacks, diabetes, strokes, and Alzheimer's disease among people afraid to seek care in hospitals or unable to get it. Overall, the CDC found that quote unquote excess deaths have occurred every week since March, 2020 with a peak during the week of April 11th and another during the week ending August 8th. Those dates roughly coincide with the virus's surge into the New York metro area near the start of the outbreak and a second major rise across the Sun Belt when many states reopened too soon in an effort to revive flagging economies. All told, an estimated 299,028 more people died than would be expected in a typical year, which was defined as the average annual deaths from 2015 to 2019, the CDC reported. 
It said 198,081 of those fatalities were caused by COVID-19 with the remainder attributable to other causes. While the virus continues to prey mainly on older people and disproportionately African-Americans and Latinos, the rate of excess mortality among 25 to 44 year olds was less expected. Among 45 to 64 year olds, the increase was 14.4% and among 65 to 74 year olds, it was 24.1%. The unexpectedly high mortality rates for adults in the prime of their lives from 25 to 65 has been a source of ongoing concern for public health experts and others in recent years, especially since a spike in deaths from drugs, alcohol and suicide was recognized. Lauren M. Rawson, a senior health statistician at the National Center for Health Statistics and lead author of Tuesday's report, said the death rate in the young adult age group was trending up before the pandemic, but it's still not clear why excess deaths for 25 to 44 year olds rose so quickly. I don't think we know specifically the answer to that question yet, Rawson said. In part, a large change reflects the general good health and low death rate among young adults, said Jeremy S. Faust, an emergency physician at Brigham and Women's Hospital in, Hos in Boston who studies excess deaths. A sudden surge in deaths from COVID-19 would change the percentages markedly. According to the CDC, 5,707 people in the 25 to 44 year age group have succumbed to COVID-19 since the beginning of the pandemic in the United States. Among racial groups, the majority of people killed by COVID-19 are white, but for people of color and especially Latinos, the new report emphasizes just how big a difference the pandemic has made in mortality. For whites, that means an excess death rate of 11.9% over a normal year. For Latinos, it's 53.6%. For Blacks, 32.9%. For Asians, 36.6%, according to the CDC. Possible explanations for the higher rates include underlying health conditions that may make people of color more vulnerable to COVID-19 and jobs as essential workers that put more Blacks and Latinos in the path of the virus. Okay, let's turn to our conversation for today. Very excited to have this conversation and introduce my guests. Emily Bow is graduate student in the Design and Urban Ecologies program at Parsons School of Design at the New School. She's a cartographer with an academic background in environmental science and is interested in countermapping and critical data studies. Her work focuses on urban systems, governance, planning and design, and digital media. Shannon Mattern is a professor at the New School for Social Research. Her writing and teaching focus on media architectures and infrastructures and spatial epistemologies. She's written books about libraries, maps, and the history of urban intelligence, and she contributes a column about urban data and mediated spaces to Places Journal. You can find her at wordsinspace.net. Erin Simmons is a PhD student in anthropology at the New School for Social Research. Her work touches on international development, poverty indices, data visualization, and monumentality. Outside of academia, Erin has worked in the development sector, cultural heritage, management and as a live performance producer in London and in New York City. Erin, Emily, and Shannon, thank you so much for making time to come on COVID calls today. Thanks for having us. Thank you. It's good to be here. Let's start the way um, that I usually do, if it's all right, just to find out where you're calling in from and what the pandemic situation is looking like there today. Emily, can I start with you, please? Sure. Um, I'm in Brooklyn. Uh, in Borum Hill, so kind of close to downtown. And um, at the moment, the pandemic situation uh, looks very different than it did six months ago. Uh, right now, it seems like it's sort of a, uh, like a street restaurant eating um, situation outdoors. That's sort of the biggest visual marker that I see right now when I'm on walks or when I'm out and about. Uh, we wrote a little bit in our paper about the six foot grid and uh, the grid that I remember seeing in the corner store, the bodega has kind of shifted to these like six foot box or like they're more eight foot boxes that where people are eating outside of restaurants now. So um, it looks, it looks very different. I think in many ways it's kind of hiding some of the surges that are happening in the city uh, in different neighborhoods. Um, so it's, it's a it's an odd kind of like double reality to sort of know that we might be facing kind of a return to what came before as sort of there's been this 
very like buoyant bucolic outdoor fall dining situation happening um, on the streets. Are you moving around the city or are you m mostly remaining there in your neighborhood? Um, I've been kind of though, taking the weekends to sort of have like a some kind of weekend adventure that gets me out on a bike or on long walks. So um, have been on very long bike rides out to uh, kind of the Rockaways and kind of Canarsie Pier, but also have been walking um, in Manhattan and doing long like um, long walks through some parks going up the West Side Highway and coming down through uh, upper Manhattan. So have tried to sort of while the weather's nice, keep uh, keep a way to like stay outside where I have one day a week where I'm not in front of a screen. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you're approaching that scientifically in any way, but as you're moving through different neighborhoods, are you able to sense differences in the way people are approaching the pandemic? Um, kind of. I think um, in the areas that I think would maybe be considered or would show up on a map as like more affluent or uh, with residents that are more affluent, there seems to be a lot more of the like kind of outdoor dining and return to that level of normal um, that maybe people have talked about. Um, in certain places I've biked through that are further away from kind of the um, the centers of the center of Brooklyn or, or in Manhattan, like it seems like there's been some non-mask wearing, but um, a lot of what I've seen, especially with, I've taken the subway, I think like six times since since March, uh, and the only folks who I haven't seen wearing masks on the subway for the most part have been actually cops. So <laughs> I, it's not, I can't draw any correlations off that, but it's been interesting to see. Can yeah, imagine that statement. You've only been on the subway six times since March. It's almost unthinkable for people who live in New York to, to say that. Thanks, Emily, for starting us out. Shannon, same question to you. I am in Manhattan and I have noticed many of the same things that Emily has, um, particularly because just the grid is different in different parts of the city, wider sidewalks, wider streets, where even if there is outdoor dining, outdoor activity, it has a different effect on pedestrian traffic, mm. a different kind of um, a palpable effect on the ambiance of the neighborhood. So those are just some and uh, variations of degrees of compliance with the mask wearing kind of uh, not rules, but uh, recommendations. And there are certain pockets of the city where we have seen, I mean, the city is trending upward slowly and we've already, uh, the governor has put in place recommended, um, not complete bans, but recommended um, kind of um, uh, cessation of travel between uh, New York, New Jersey and Pennsylvania because those numbers are going up there too. But just again, it's thinking about this beyond the street level towards the more regional level. We see kind of the geographic trends going back a bit closer to what they were in the spring as well. So things are moving at micro and macro scale. Are you going into campus? We cannot, no. There were, there were a couple days this summer where we were permitted to go in and retrieve things from our offices, but everything, not everything is closed. Librarians are there retrieving books for people to come pick up. Mm -hmm. um, Maintenance staff, security staff is still there. Some students, particularly those who maybe are in their senior year and really need to have access to like a making center to because they're architecture students or or fancy labs or something. So there is special there are special accommodations made for those students to have um, kind of exclusive access, socially distanced to on site facilities that can be replicated online. It's something you mentioned it really hit me hard yesterday. I live in New Jersey and, and that statement from the governor when he said, you know, he advises, we can't really enforce it, he says, but if we advise mm -hmm. New Yorkers not to go to New Jersey, it, mm -hmm. it, it would brought me right back to March and, mm -hmm. you know, the kind of impossibles of shutting down a region and shutting down daily traffic, um, you know, between New York and, and Connecticut and, and New Jersey, it's just really, uh, an impressive statement. I don't know what we're supposed to, again, I'm not, I'm not sure what we're supposed to make of statements like that if we're in New Jersey. I guess it means we should be taking it even more seriously than than you are. Yeah, because you're the problem. You're the problem, exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, so as long as I stay out here, I guess you're fine. But, yeah. But it also um, just reminds us, going back to Emily, like Emily's interest in cartography, just these overlapping jurisdictions that don't map onto one another. So you had the legal, the political boundaries that don't map on to kind of cultural kind of uh, receptions of the whole pandemic and responses to it. So, yeah. Right, exactly. Um, okay, so thank you for that update. Shannon and Aaron, let's, let's turn to you. Where are you calling from and what's it looking like there? 
Uh, hello, I am calling from Santa Fe, New Mexico. Uh, so we are experiencing uh, a real rise in cases. We're up about 130% over the last 14 days. Um, and it's been really interesting, especially having spent most of the pandemic in New York City. Indoor dining is still possible here. The gyms are still open. People are very diligently wearing masks and being incredibly compliant with social distancing rules. but I am kind of sitting here waiting, as I'm sure many people in Santa Fe are, for things to start shutting down again. Um, especially the last couple of weekends, it's been really clear that there are a lot of tourists coming in and out of New Mexico. Um, it's a big destination for people from states that had really high numbers, you know, a month, two weeks ago, and now we are some of that is trickling in, I think. So things here are beginning to get it's beginning to feel a bit tense. <laughs> Is that um, the kind of a situation where you are not the only New Yorker or person from the Northeast? To, so you're seeing it twice now. It is kind of an interesting I, effect. Yeah, I do feel like I'm seeing it twice. I think, as Emily mentioned, um, New York has had a very specific experience of the pandemic and places in the Southwest that haven't seen numbers like this. Um, there's just a different approach. And I think people are starting to feel here, maybe the way that we felt in New York in March and April, that this is becoming uh, scary. It's becoming scary in a way that it wasn't earlier in the spring and summer, especially as the temperatures drop and being in a park is less pleasant than it used to be. I think we're seeing people kind of uh, shift their behavior to some extent. I don't have a very good handle on the politics of New Mexico. I mean, I know that it's trended to be a blue state in more recent years, and that's not always the best index of how people are gonna act in this pandemic, but it's it's been relatively reliable. And at the same time, I mean, I'm from Texas originally, and I know attitudes to being told by public health officials how to behave don't even go over well with liberals in Texas always. Is it the same thing in New Mexico? Um, I am actually a, a Texas native myself, so I'm familiar with that. But here in New Mexico, um, the governor is has been very active in asking people to stay inside, to not uh, meet in groups. She enacted some new uh, protocols last week that limited groups to five people. And when I say I'm waiting for things to shut down, I think part of that is knowing that she wouldn't hesitate to shut things down if it looked like that was really what needed to happen. I'm, there are pockets of New Mexico that are not as liberal. I think particularly near the Colorado border, there's some more uh, trending red areas, but hopefully people will understand what needs to be done to shut this down. So one, I'd like to start out, if, if you don't mind, I'm going to actually read a, a quote from some, towards the beginning of an of a article that the three of you co-authored that appeared over the summer. And I think this will bring us into our conversation about data visualization. And I'm just going to, the title for people who are looking for it is um, Critical COVID Data Visualization, sorry, Learning from Lines, Critical COVID Data Visualizations and the Quarantine Quotidian. This appeared in Big Data and Society in July. And I'm just going to read a couple sentences from it. People have the capacity to personalize and participate in the creation of meaningful COVID visualizations, many of which represent other scales and dimensions of the pandemic, especially the quarantine quotidian. COVID's countermappers prompt their publics, whose attention is often trained on flattening the curve, to also look behind or under the curve, to critically assess the making of COVID-19 visualizations and to plot curves and charts and maps of their own. Now, there's a lot in there and I'm really glad we can talk about this because the amount of data we're all consuming every day in COVID time is pretty staggering. And um, it's been a theme we've talked about on COVID calls a fair amount, but we haven't really talked about it in this way that you're describing, um, which is a, a attempts to not only understand it, but push back, subvert, reinterpret and intervene in it. So whoever would like to take this first, I just wanna ask you if you could tell us what's the, quarantine quotidian, and then let's talk a little bit more about the piece. 
I could maybe take the quarantine quotidian piece, but then I think your question really, you pulled a nice quote out of the article because we took, I kind of div divided our labor a bit in writing this piece and each took, took a section. And I think that particular passage really gets into some of Emily's territory where it's looking at kind of the um, critical collections of data, critical reflections on what the who, what is and isn't included in data sets, and then a lot of Aaron's work by looking at uh, the specific individualized or small group or isolated but collective responses that people can have with using this data or generating their own kind of ambient or embodied data. So the quarantine quotidian kind of use that phrase just because first of all, I love alliteration and there's usually a piece of alliteration in everything I write somewhere, uh, but also it's just reminding us that uh, the curve is something that we have seen that is ubiquitous in the news. It's kind of uh, driven our it's our new epistemology, our ontology. We want to kind of live a decreasing, a flattening curve. It's driven policy. So that visualization has been ubiquitous, but it is not just something that is abstracted and from a 10,000 foot view from the, from the standpoint of policy or at a macro scale kind of a national scale population. It's also something that our individual actions just going back to the questions you were asking earlier about individual people's compliance with mask wearing laws, for instance, there does seem to be on the whole a realization that individual actions kind of have an impact on the depression of the curve and that um, it, it has palpably affected people's everyday lives. Just the activities we do in our home, the number of times we wash our hands, how frequently we leave the front door, all of these things are the quotidian that are transformed dramatically by this kind of looming curve. So I'll stop there. No, it's good. And just to follow up a, a little bit on that, do you, how do you think about, well, let, let, me, let me put it this way. I often feel this disconnect. I mean, every day on COVID calls, I read these numbers and I consume these numbers, but then I also have my own, you know, this, my own quotidian, my own daily experience of the, of the quarantine. And then somewhere in between those two is an uncertain space where I feel myself a lot of the time. It's a, I've described it as a sort of an uncanny experience for disaster researchers who are find themselves now somehow in the middle of the kinds of things that they usually study. I don't know if that resonates with you, Shannon. I mean, it seems like that's part of what you're trying to, to capture here with this. Yeah, I mean, it's really hard to live in a rectilinear grid. I mean, modernist designers have found this too. You can impose kind of um, uh, linear forms on people, but our bodies are not linear. So even like the lines on the sidewalk, the new the stickers that are on the floor in the grocery store, um, you can't wear a mask all the time. When I'm, I take walks, long walks outside often too. And when there's nobody around me, I'll take my mask off for a little bit, but then a runner will come by and I wonder like, was that too close? So there are all these gray areas that you kind of, just because of kind of organic life does not live in a kind of a geometric grid. Um, you're inevitably going to be in between those those slots in the grid at various points throughout the day, Emily, both literally and metaphorically. Sorry. Yeah, thank you for that, Emily. Let me let me bring you in um, just about this piece, but I think also because maybe you can sort of set the stage for us a little bit here about data access and COVID nineteen. I guess I'm just sort of curious at a at a sort of basic level, what is available and and what isn't when you think about the types of data that they're people are pulling from. I mean, clearly what I read at the beginning, that story, the CDC story, and I usually read the Johns Hopkins University coronavirus numbers. I think I have a general sense of where they're pulling that data, but that's a pretty narrow stream, right? I mean, that's just coming from a couple of public health agencies. What else is available and maybe what isn't available? Yeah, so one project that um, kind of quickly came up on our radar and I think we started following because it was some journalists who had started this as kind of like a volunteer effort is this thing called the COVID tracking project which basically started as a aggregate and in some ways kind of makes slightly more visible how this data is getting from its source into a map. I think the Johns Hopkins visualization is was really kind of the first one that everyone saw where you kind of it felt like people were checking it every day, but I think the, uh, the side effect of it coming with the Johns Hopkins label and kind of the interface that it had is it looks very, very official, um, which it is in some ways, but it also masks a lot of the ways that the data is really imperfect when it's getting sourced into that map. Um, and COVID tracking, I think they have more of a volunteer uh, based model and they've ha been working with teams of volunteers that kind of are starting at the individual county level. Sorry, there's a big truck outside here. 
um, <laughs> individual county level um, and and working with state agencies that are releasing a lot of this data and even going down to um, some of the like hospitals that were starting to release data. So it kind of depended on like the different geographies. There really wasn't, I think one, from what I understand from people who have written about the data cleaning process for a lot of their mapping efforts um, and case tracking efforts is that a huge part of it is this kind of wrangling of a very, very messy data set that is neither standardized nor um, kind of like decided or, or, or like made clear ahead of time by everyone. Um, and a lot of the uh, like data exports that were coming were sort of in the form that was easiest for hospitals to navigate at the times when it was sort of hitting places the hardest. So there's a really interesting story about kind of like data wrangling and what some folks call being the kind of work of being like data janitor work, which is really mm. like 80% of any data project before you actually get to any kind of visualization is the work needed to actually take something and and kind of clean it and transform it. But there's um, there's some cost to that because it, it makes it seem much more standardized, I think, to the viewer <laughs> than it ever was uh, coming in. So that was, that was one kind of interesting part of this data thing. The other thing that came up a lot, um, a lot of case counts were being released by zip code, which um, there was a period of like, I think it was during April on Twitter, um, where like all of the map nerds on Twitter were having fits about the fact that all the maps that were coming out were coming out with zip code. Like that was how they were doing, um, it's called like, chloroplath mapping, which is basically like you have the administrative boundary and it's color coded based on some kind of like range mm -hmm. grouping um, for number of cases or for density. And the way that the numbers were being released in many cases in different cities were by zip code, which is not a standardized uh, area. It's like meant for the postal service. It is not meant as a sort of standardizable, you know, there's not a common density. There's not a common there's nothing really about it that is sort of significant other than mm. that it's an efficient routing system for the postal service. So zip codes as this like epidemiological boundary became this really big uh, kind of discussion point on Twitter. Um, and for anyone who's ever sat in kind of a like introductory 101 GIS class at some point, there is a lesson about this thing called the modifiable aerial unit problem, which is essentially that if data is being given inside of one boundary, you can't easily port it to another one without understanding what's happening in that boundary. So there were a lot of attempts to try to standardize these zip code models with some fancy math or using, um, like using, there was a couple people that were using the buildings data set for the city of New York and then calculating capacities based on like number of units in those buildings to try to get an understanding of where mm -hmm. groupings of people would be inside of a zip code so that they could better understand density um, in like census tracts where they were basically able to take that data that came as zip codes and start mapping it with more demographic data that comes out of things like the census. So it was this interesting um, kind of, that was like a very technical infighting thing that happened on Twitter that basically folks who map for a living um, were starting to get really frustrated that they were seeing these maps that were going viral um, partially because nonprofits and groups who had access to very kind of uh, easy to use mapping technology were taking data that was easily provided by the city or by whatever health agency and being able to map it, but it was kind of missing some of um, the kind of caveats. And one of the big things um, that came out of that was this early disconnect about um, kind of the racialized nature of the data and the mm -hmm. fact that those early numbers were really hiding the way that um, right. COVID was just disproportionately hitting communities of color um, in a way that it really wasn't hitting um, like other kind of more well-off white areas. And so, um, yeah, we, we, looked at a, we looked at data for black lives as part of the paper writing process. And then also the COVID tracking project um, kind of added a section about race and COVID-19 onto their website. So I can actually link that in the chat. I think you can share yeah, that. Yeah, and I can, and I can bring that up. Uh, Aaron, let me bring you into the to the conversation on this too. I mean, Emily's gotten us, you know, sort of into April, I think, um, and a time in which I think everybody was refreshing constantly 
um, to look at these visualizations and they were um, state by state. And then as Emily's pointed out, you know, within states breaking down in ways that were easy for the data providers, but that don't necessarily make sense if you're trying to understand the nuances of the pandemic. Can you, I'd like to just get your take on that and maybe say a little bit more about how people started to react to that. People who know how to provide alternative visualizations, what were they doing? Yeah, I think it's a very interesting question. The first thing that you mentioned that, you know, we were all kind of constantly refreshing these web pages to see yeah, right. if the red had gotten darker or if a different state had turned a different color. Something that was actually um, brought to my attention yesterday through Twitter is that uh, sources like the New York Times are no longer putting those data visualizations up at the top of their uh, web pages. So if you, if you visit for example, the New York Times, now you have to scroll down quite a way to get to those, um, which I just think is an interesting, you know, we, we're starting to relate to those visualizations in a different way that like kind of need to constantly have the most recent and updated data has faded to some extent, or at least the major news providers, providers perceive it to have faded as they're not kind of hitting you with it as soon as you open their website. Um, one of the things that we noticed a lot of when we were beginning to research this paper is the ways that people were overwhelmed by the amount of data that they were being uh, kind of thrown into, um, as well as the kind of the need to step back and feel as you mentioned, that kind of liminal middle space, you know, I know what my day to day is like in this pandemic. And I see these numbers that are a little bit too big for me to really wrap my head around. But that middle ground where I understand kind of how other people are moving around in their daily lives, how I relate to how other people are experiencing this pandemic, people needed that to be able to kind of understand that level for the pandemic to to make some more sense, I think. And so we saw a lot of really incredible work from artists, from data scientists um, around the country and around the world, trying to put this into more human terms. So for example, um, requesting recordings of people in their homes and then splicing them together into a quarantine track that includes everything from someone uh, uh, recording a squeaky floorboard in their apartment to recording their son trying to get through a science lesson, uh, a cat, you know, uh, scratching on the door, or even just the silence of being inside their homes. Um, something that allowed people to be in relation with other people while they were experiencing this. Um, we also saw a lot of really interesting, uh, in the article we refer to them as data visceralizations. So projects that allowed people to embody their experiences during the pandemic. Uh, for example, in the article we referenced the Environmental Performance Agency, which had a series of COVID protocols that you could videotape yourself doing and then send to them for a database. And these ranged from placing your hand on your favorite window when it was sunny, placing your face on it, having a conversation with a tree that you could see outside of your window, tracking bird movements. Mm -hmm. um, and as we kind of gathered these together, it became really clear that these people who are participating in these kind of uh, alternative data projects, you know, it's, it's not that different than looking at these big, I mean, it's it's trying to be part of a collective experience in a more, I don't want to use the term user friendly, but in, in a more, um, in a way that we can relate to uh, much more quickly and viscerally than having to stare at this really scary looking graph and make sense of the numbers all on our own and, you know, mm. try and wrap our head around what R is and and things like that. There's something really powerful in that to me too, which is that I think the sort of meta argument of a lot of the data visualizations early on, particularly were that the only measure that mattered was death. Mm -hmm. The case count, okay, um, 
recovery. That I know the Hopkins started reporting the recoveries pretty early. And I remember when that first popped in and I thought that was pretty in, enlightening because that seemed to tell a slightly different story and that was worth following up on. But mainstream media was mostly putting up the death rates. And um, I think as you've all already said, and I think as we you know, people who've been following this know, the inequalities that have been exposed, I mean, they shouldn't be surprising to anybody, but they're extraordinary. And they tell a remarkably different story than just the, the death count. And just the death count doesn't capture the long-term, the sort of long haul consequences for people who have recovered and whatever that means. And it doesn't capture mental health and, and everything else. Shannon, let me bring you back in on this because um, I guess I wanna know just to step back one step. This is more of like a cognitive psychology question so you can pass if you want to, but why do people, what's, what's so seductive about the dashboard? You know, because I think it, it, it's happening with our politics too. You know, and and I feel like I can, I can say I can, I'm doing this because I'm doing research. Okay, but going back and forth from these data visualizations to 538 or other places that visualize the politics, it is, you can get pulled into that. And then that, that dashboard, I can't quite figure out why it's satisfying, but it is. Can you say what you think about that? So one thing that people have been talking about in most recent weeks since schools opened back up is how, how the definition of a dashboard, dashboard has become infinitely elastic. So there are some universities who claim to have COVID dashboards for their campuses or campi, whatever the plural is, that are essentially just PDFs that are maybe updated once a day with really questionable data that then you just post to a website and voila, a dashboard. Ideally, a dashboard is going to reflect multiple forms of real-time data that are necessary, critical to the operation of a system, a vehicle, whatever the case may be. But um, I wrote a piece a couple years ago about the fetishization of the dashboard, particularly in regard to urban governance. But it has a much longer history, obviously. We can think of like the Bloomberg terminal, which gives people the sense of kind of omniscient overview of everything, that, everything that's meaningful that's happening in the markets that allows for flawless prediction or the best predictive powers. We can track it back further to um, the uh, um, Stanford Beer, the kind of Project Cybersyn that Elena Medina has written beautifully about in her book from several years ago, where it was like a, a control room, essentially, that was supposed to give people all the information they needed to efficiently and effectively run a government. Um, to the history of the cockpit, the history of the dashboard in the car, all of which is kind of a way of embodying Again, I keep using this word in all of my work. It's about embodying epistemology in a way. What people feel like they need to know to be efficient operators of something, whether that is a car, a plane, a government, or a healthcare system. There's obviously a lot of hubris in that. There's a lot that's left out, especially just given what doesn't fit on a screen, what does not lend itself to quantification, what can't be represented in a bar graph. These are all the affective stories that Aaron was talking about, all the lives that slip through the cracks that Emily was talking about, all of the kind of the long COVID stories that people are mentioning, the fact that they claim to have, they were told they had recovered, but they've been feeling effects for, where do they fit on a data in a data set? So this is all the stuff that doesn't really fit neatly on a dashboard because it's supposed to be streamlined, widgetized presentation of easily digestible facts to allow for pretty rapid decision making. That's in part why it's such an appealing construct. It's it, there's, I mean, inherently there should be something kind of democratizing about it, right? I mean, in some mm -hmm. sense we we crave it because it does seem to offer transparency. But everything that's been coming up in our conversation right now, I mean, this term that is used, the data janitors, I think Emily, you said that. Um, the amount of, of, of care, cleaning, clipping, packaging that goes on before it makes it into the dashboard, that's a meta level of transparency, which also has to be required. So then you need a dashboard for your dashboard. It gets a little bit um, confusing. <laughs> Well, you do have things like data worksheets and data sheets for data sets and other types of things that you can, if you are interested, if you are kind of an, an advanced user of a, of, a, of a dashboard or another type of a data, uh, open data website, for instance, you can get the story, the biography of the data set. But it does require some kind of um, uh, 
extra degree of knowledge, there is some barrier to entry there to understand what those are. With a dashboard and with a lot of data visualizations, and this is not a unique critique at all, the challenge is because it's all supposed to be presented in one screen or on one sheet, one appealing mm -hmm. graphic, you might have some tiny footnotes, but often you're not going to even know where the data come from, how they were processed, how they were cleaned, what assumptions were made, anything about methodology. But I will also, yes, we're kind of turning towards critique here, but yes, there is something also empowering and democratizing by making people realize they should want to ask questions about to not just kind of walk in lockstep with policy changes, but to ask about the data they're informing policy, to have a macro scale view of what's happening in their community or nation. These are all good things. It's just kind of the limits, recognizing also the limitations of visualizations and dashboards too. Just a reminder that you're listening to COVID calls and we're talking about data visualization and COVID-19 with Aaron Simmons, Emily Bow, and Shannon Mattern. And Emily, let me come back to you. I wanna talk about the, the city a little bit. Um, and I really like your description of moving around the city. And when I was a person who lived in New York and in Philadelphia, um, that was my by far favorite thing to do. And when you do it over time, you notice minute changes um, in storefronts or in sidewalks. I mean, I think when you start noticing, um, you know, cracks that hadn't appeared before in road surfaces, then you know you've really been walking around the city a lot. And it sounds like that may be something you like to do. Um, and I wonder if you could comment a little bit about um, what the lockdown period particularly revealed about how we could be thinking of the city differently. What did that period of time particularly, mm -hmm. but I mean, even to now, what kind of cartographic insights could that reveal? Hmm. It's an interesting question. I, think um, I stole it from yeah. Italo Calvino. I taught imaginary cities <laughs> uh, last month. I hadn't taught that book in an awful long time and actually found it really kind of enlightening again in, in terms that we're thinking about right now. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. But. No, yeah, I mean, I think there's one of the, I guess, there was sort of, I, there was like periods during lockdown. So there was a period when like the sort of salient memory that I have, and Erin kind of touched on this a little bit with some of the work she was speaking about was basically birds and sirens. That was all I heard for the entire time I was awake. It was like, you know, maybe 10 sirens an hour. And that was, I remember being woken up by birds, which in New York City is like kind of an insane thing to even say, because you couldn't really hear birds before. Um, and so in some ways, Jer Thorpe had a piece of work that he put out that we talked about in our paper that was called Burbs which was basically different bird calls and being able to uh, identify them in different parts of the city. There was also, I think, one thing that uh, that Aaron and I are actually kind of exploring right now is like the movement kind of people flocking into parks and like parks becoming this refuge space for a lot of people, just being able to get out of their apartments um, and kind of like what that did, the like kind of reliance on the park system in the time when we could be outside. And um, I think redrawing maybe some of the like ways that people moved through their neighborhoods circulated around getting to parks or getting to open space. One thing that I personally noticed is that at least in New York, um, I was traveling on my bike much more. That became because the subway for a long time, no one really knew what Kind of, we, there was a whole period when we didn't really know much about COVID, and so no one was really taking the subway unless they had to. And um, it meant that rather than experiencing the city as a series of subway stops, um, I was suddenly like going kind of off grid, so to speak, or like I was suddenly tracking through different parts of the city that I, that on a subway are not adjacent to each other, but on a bike certainly you pass through and. There were a lot of ways that that became a really interesting way to experience the city um, because I think particularly in New York, just with the reliance on public transit, neighborhoods get linked by like which neighborhoods are next to each other on the stops. And when people are talking about gentrification, they're talking about, you know, stops on the L or whatever. And um, it was interesting to start to see the way that these different places were next to each other and may share characteristics, but also like had very different things going on. There was a point when I needed to pick something up that was a, a purchase on Craigslist. And I had to trek across from downtown Brooklyn into Forest Hills, Queens uh, on a bike, which was mm -hmm. like a very interesting journey 
cutting through a lot of swaths of the city that are not necessarily experienced next to each other. Um, and so I think as folks maybe were able to get outside, that might have been a common experience as well. There was some environmental um, writing in around that time as well. I have seen fewer stories around this, but that made this point about, you know, that was dramatic decrease um, in carbon emissions um, because of the suspension of global transportation, basically. But it, it strikes me that there may be a sort of analogy at the at the sort of pedestrian and bicycle level of what you're describing, because it did illuminate. I mean, everything we've been told was completely impossible. Um, all of a sudden, we're like, well, not only is it impossible, but collectively people do this without being forced by the state even to do it. I don't want to push this too far, but I, I am curious what you think if you if you sort of turn that into like urban planning lessons or things that you, you know, if, if you were brought in to meet with the mayor mm -hmm. and say what's possible in the city that you don't think is possible that you learned in that moment, what, what would come to mind? Well, I mean, I think one thing that's tricky about that is I think the pandemic, um, I had a professor during classes that when they kind of shifted online, who was sort of really encouraging us to be like, documenting in, in kind of diary format day by day, like how things were changing. Um, and I think as part of it, there were a lot of pushes to making the city kind of like more accessible and kind of, um, I don't know, some critiques of existing spaces and like the needing to sort of open up parts of the city that had traditionally been closed off as a way to kind of give people places to go. But I think one maybe like I don't know, one challenge of that right now we're seeing, like I was mentioning before, those like restaurant pods that are popping up is this encroachment into public space of kind of private entities. And so there's then this um, kind of, that is happening at the same time that right. New York is struggling and has struggled to navigate policy around homelessness. And has in fact, like there was a, a big kind of kerfuffle on the Upper West Side about folks who were staying in a hotel, um, most folks who were, who were staying in a hotel that was empty otherwise, and the neighborhood kind of like slowly getting riled up and politically kind of pushing them out. And so you have these things that I think are responding in positive ways, but also um, mm -hmm. some ways that I think like slowly things are changing and we're kind of not noticing uh, potentially in a way that's not super great. Aaron, let me ask you, I wanted to ask you what you thought about um, how the memory of the pandemic might get inscribed into the city. I mean, it's another way that I think, you know, data visualization um, doesn't capture history and memory very well, um, at least in my experience. And, you know, I'm thinking a lot about, and I, um, it was really struck with the the mass grave, for example, at Hearts Island, and some early stories. There was one that Maggie Jones wrote in the New York Times. I don't know if you remember it about the funeral parlor in the Bronx, where they ran out of space in this neighborhood funeral parlor, and you get these stories like running out of coffins, and those kinds of those are other measures, and they tap into deeper memories of pandemics that connect us across long distances of time. I don't know what may be happening in New York or other cities right now around that. I wonder if that's something that's been on your mind. Yeah, it's a really interesting question and it has been on my, it's been on my mind quite a lot. Uh, one of the um, images that we looked at when we were initially writing this piece was um, uh, we were looking at for the indexical landscape section, which was just pictures of rows of coffins which is such a more immediate kind of gut punch to look at and think about than, you know, a, a data visualization that indexes the death count. Um, I think this is an incredibly interesting time to be talking about memorializing anything as we have watched all summer memorials and monuments and obelisks come tumbling down. Uh, and I think it's a really, you know, I don't, I don't have an answer for how this should be inscribed. And I don't think there is a single way that this should be inscribed 
in our memories. But I do think that we're at a time when people are are beginning to think about how we remember things without necessarily, you know, building the cenotaph or or inscribing it in stone. Like, what does it mean to memorialize something without that kind of permanent materialization and can it be done? I immediately think of the early in the pandemic New York Times cover that listed a thousand names. Um, we're of course far past a thousand names now and we're even at that point that was merely a subset of people who had passed away due to COVID. But I think a lot of people are beginning to talk about a kind of a, a feminist monumentality, a feminist project of memory that would be unprescriptive, that would uh, kind of take into account multiple directionalities, multiple histories, would hope to be able to impart some of the layers of this crisis that is not just you know, when I think of monuments and uh, in particular monuments to those who've passed away, with the exception perhaps of the Vietnam War Memorial in Washington, DC, they are often invisible in their visibility. You walk past them without really thinking about them after some time. And so is there a way that we can move away from that and make these more lasting and more kind of robust with, I guess, kind of counterintuitively by making them potentially more ephemeral. Um, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not an expert. I'm not an artist. There are a lot of artists and speculative designers who are doing incredible work. I want to uh, point people who are interested to an organization called Monument Lab, which is also based in Philadelphia, who are exploring these questions. And yeah, it's just a very specific and interesting time to be thinking about how we will remember this pandemic. I also have one. Yeah, kind of I'd like to hear to from everybody on this. In. Absolutely. Um, there was an interesting thing a few weeks ago. Um, a group that's called COVID Survivors for Change um, set up 20,000 plastic folding chairs on the National Mall as kind of this visual representation of um, kind of the, the rising death counts and they're like this nonpartisan group um, that was coming together, trying to advocate for resources, especially for survivors, but also trying to get the number under control. Um, and as I saw the images that were coming out, I saw, I think I saw it first on Twitter and then I started like looking for different angles to sort of see how people had captured it. Um, because in one way it did kind of bring up the six foot grid um, Kind of idea that we had looked at in the paper but it's also the chairs aren't spaced six feet away and they're much more just like this empty kind of sea of people that would be there otherwise and in many ways it reminded me there's a at the oklahoma city bombing memorial um one kind of integral piece of the actual memorial because when that building came down there was a daycare inside um and there were children there that were killed as well um so they have 168 chairs um, that are these like brass chairs that are sitting as part of the memorial. Um, and at the time, I think it was an idea that came out of um, a German couple. I had to look this up because I remembered it was a competition, but it was a German couple um, who had a, it's called Butzer Design Partnership. And they were kind of proposing this at the same time that Berlin was going through their competition for um, the memorial to the, what, what is now called the Memorial to the Murdered Jews of Europe. Um, and so it's this interesting thing about like these physical blocks or chairs sort of marking um, death and marking space where people would have been, that it felt like it was kind of drawing this historical line back through to other memorials too. But it was more like more temporary. It had, you know, it's folding chairs that are set up on the National Mall. I'm learning so much from this conversation. Uh, Shannon, let me bring you up in on the memorial aspect. Uh, sure. So, I mean, Emily mentioned the fact that um, I think this goes back to a question you were asking Emily earlier about how do we see all of these discussions informing 
um, urban planning, urban design, and kind of like the management of other urban systems. There have been, and I think it's not coincidental, other concurrent discussions that have been happening that I think feed directly into all of the COVID related proposals for a new future. And that's our kind of, there's a new book that came out recently, lots of discussion about what would a feminist city look like? I am blanking on the author's name right now, but I can look it up in just a second. Um, and then also decolonizing. And what does it mean to make anti-race? What would an anti-racist memorial look like? What would a decolonized memorial look like? And they pr probably don't have the same materiality. They probably don't claim space the same way. And I think this also is relevant related to the fact that, you know, several of us, all of us have mentioned the fact that so much of the information we've received is based on social media a world in which our information, our feeds, they are they are inherently inf ephemeral themselves, which is in some, some ways presenting challenges to archivists, developing new practices. So maybe the way in which we build memorials based on those facts, kind of the, the, the ephemerality of data should reflect the fact and needs to take into account the fact that the, the kind of the factual basis of memorialization itself is ephemeral. The, this, that's another part I hadn't really Fully comprehended until it's all kind of snapping in to hear you all talk about it in, in this way. And I think back to what Aaron was saying, I think something really profound in this idea that you, that the, the greatest memorial of this time may very well be that surge of pulling down memorials. I don't think I, that had clicked for me until you were talking, but that, you know, if you think of Richmond, Virginia, and you think about that monument row and they haven't brought them all down yet but they've been reinterpreted robert e lee is never going to be robert e lee like he was before in virginia before this that that's interesting because that taking down that monumentality to me reinterprets the memorial because the vocabulary of memorial in the united states at least usually is around war and death and so the thing that is to be remembered is usually it's a male death with a name and, and I think, you know, Emily, you mentioning um, Oklahoma City, I agree with you. It's an extraordinary memorial because it pushes back against that in a pretty strong, in a pretty strong way. And I, I guess the thing that I've been thinking about is how you, the other measure, and I've been talking a lot with Robert Soden and Jacqueline Vernemont about this. What are the other measures? Like how there should be a memorial to care, but what, would, what, is, a, what is a care memorial? look like and what does a care memorial look like if it isn't does if it doesn't physically take up space in the city when maybe those funds should be going to other things maybe the the funds that that would go from foundations to create that memorial need to go into education or healthcare provision or some other things i just think we're not used to considering memorials in that way i don't know aaron let me bring you back in and to see if you if you want to say anything else about it because what you're proposing i think what we're talking about here the word memorial, as we commonly understand it, connected with a disaster, doesn't seem to hold. Yeah, I think, I mean, this is something that we've been talking about in connection with memorials. I think it also applies to discussions around data, the way data is used and data visualization is we need to start asking different questions about who we are making these things for, who will be uh, viewing them, who will be interacting with them. You know, you mentioned a memorial to care workers. Or is it a memorial for care workers? Is it to celebrate care workers? Where, you know, how do we want people to, what message do we want them to take away from it? How do we want people to interact with it? I think these are some of the really key questions that we've been talking about with these kind of alternative data uses as well as like, sit down, take a moment, like, what, where is your, where is your motivation coming from and who are you kind of offering this to? I think that's a big part of the kind of movement for data feminism that's been really prevalent in the last couple of years, this kind of uh, desire to make things more multivocal, more multidirectional to show your work to kind of bring in much larger communities, you know, not just to kind of design something for display, but to make it a larger process and experience. And I think if we start thinking of memorials in that way as well as kind of a larger community building process, as opposed to just like, where are we gonna put this giant statue? Uh, then 
we'll come up with things that are much more meaningful ultimately and that resonate with larger groups of people. Just to remind everybody that you're listening to COVID calls and we're talking today about data visualization and COVID-19 and memory and the city and cartography and, and lots of other things with Shannon Matter and Emily Bowe and Aaron Simmons. We have a few minutes left. You can still get a question in if you want to just put it up in the YouTube live chat or you can put it up on Twitter. Just be sure to tag me at US of Disaster. There was another topic I wanted to get to. One of my favorite pieces of writing um, is a piece you wrote, Shannon, um, in 2017 in Places Journal about the big data of the Anthropocene and uh, had a chance to teach that essay actually this summer in a history of climate change course I taught with Yon Sil Kang at Drexel and the students really reacted to that. And, and I had a chance to talk about the Anthropocene with um, some of the folks from the House of World Culture in Berlin and the Max Planck Institute, uh, Bernd Shearer, Christoph Rosal, if people are more interested to know about the Anthropocene, they could check out that episode. One of the premises of the Anthropocene is that humans are the dominant shaping force on the planet and that our shaping will be known through our, our waste, uh, things we consider waste, um, the byproducts of our processes. And I've been, it's, I've been wondering what the pandemic layer of the Anthropocene might look like and I'm not trying to be fancy with that question. I think that there will be, this time is looking different in lots of different ways. Well, one of the ways is actually how we are impacting the planet in biodiversity and emissions in other ways. I don't, I don't know if you've thought about that at all or, or if you'd like to react to that, Shannon, let me bring you in first on what this time pretends for the way we're thinking about, you know, sort of big data kind of things like keeping track of the Anthropocene. Mm -hmm. So I'm also really curious to hear what Emily and Aaron have to say about this eventually, but just one immediate and maybe too ready, too obviously ready to hand example is just the, the, the prevalence of polystyrene. I mean, it is our, it's in our masks and in our, um, white, our wet wipes, the things, the things we wipe everything down with. I mean, I, I go to the gym occasionally, my YMCA is open, but everything is, is vastly socially distanced. And I see people pulling the wet wipes out 10 at a time and thinking about all of that is going into, a actually probably not going into a landfill, it's going into the sewers and it's gonna create a fat berg and it's going to like explode in, uh, on, a, on a street somewhere. So I feel like there, there is going to, there's a, a preponderance of polystyrene these days, a waste culture that is legitimated there are certain types of licenses that are, are exceptions that will make in a moment of disaster. So there's a way, new waste culture that I think has been legitimated and condoned because the exceptional circumstances make a behavior that wouldn't otherwise be okay, okay. So that's one thing. I think we've also realized that like our manufacturing, supply chains, logistics of uh, agricultural systems, all of these things have to like, um, adopt a new geography a new kind of operational landscape has to emerge because of all the breakages in those chains that have been evidenced by these multiplying or compounding disasters of this year. So those are a few things. Let me just open that up to mm -hmm. Emily, bring you in on, on this question of the, of the Anthropocene. I, it, one of the reasons I find it useful at this time is just playing with the idea, even if you're not a geologist and I'm not, it does once again draw us into this question of what do we care to count and in what proportions and what do we care to visualize and, and why and why not? Yeah, I mean, I think Shannon touched on one thing that I think is kind of interesting um, in this is like the foods, the impact of the food system on the food systems and also the ways I think it's forcing people to rethink um, or start to rethink possibly global agriculture because I think there's, um, there's been some writing about links between kind of the way that monocultures in food production and in grow, crop growing and in the way that we've sort of highly uh, engineered our food that has kind of, like I think, created these, uh, I guess you'd call them, and I'm not an epidemiologist, but kind of, you know, portals um, where disease vectors that probably wouldn't have entered the human system mm -hmm. have because of the way we've genetically modified food and the way we've... Um, Kind of treated genetically modified animals and so there's there's kind of an interesting thing there about what does it mean to rethink food um particularly as labor was such a huge um 
thing that was disrupted during the pandemic. Um, and I think, I don't know, it, my, I guess my, my only take on this is sort of, it'll be interesting to see how long-term maybe food systems shift. Um, one thing that I had no idea before this all happened is that on the island of Manhattan, any given point in time, this came up multiple times early on in the pandemic, there's only a couple of days of food at any one time because yeah, right. of the way that kind of global logistics Just system in had to come in. Yeah. yeah, and so it was this kind of interesting question of like, okay, there's only you know what four and a half days of food or whatever it is at any given time in New York. Um, what does that look like for global supply chains and how do you, uh, how could you possibly reimagine that so that it's more resistant to something like this mm -hmm. going forward? Erin, want to come in on this? Yeah, I think I mean, whenever someone mentions the Anthropocene or any kind of geological era, I immediately start thinking about stratigraphy and, and like, you know, what, what will be in the layer, what the layers will look like. I've been really interested to think about these like processes of kind of hyper-localization we've been going through. The, you know, wandering the kind of boundaries of my neighborhood extensively and how much is contained within that. And when I think of the Anthropocene, I think of these kind of giant, you know, to talk about big data, you know, the big, the airplane maps, you know, with every flight crisscrossing the globe or the you know, the electricity maps that show everything kind of lit up. I'm I'm wondering if we're entering a period where those those maps start forming kind of bounded circles, if we stop seeing that kind of giant global flow of data in and instead transition to these kind of more local like siloed. I don't know. I mean I also think people will probably start flying again when they can start flying again, but I know that my view and a lot of the views of people around me about what it means to be local, what it means to kind of spend time locally, collect data locally are, are changing. And uh, I'm interested to see kind of what those big data collections look like when people are just moving in different ways and experiencing the local and the global in different ways. I want to remind everyone that you've been listening to COVID Calls, and you can catch COVID Calls every weekday at 5 p.m. Eastern Time. Please join me tomorrow. I'll be talking with Dave Wessner about HIV, AIDS, and COVID-19. And I want to thank my guests today. What a uh, mind-expanding hour. Thank you so much, Aaron Simmons and Emily Bowe and Shannon Matter. And I do hope you'll write a uh, follow up to that wonderful piece, and I'll be sure to um, post it again on Twitter. Learning from Lines Critical COVID Data Visualizations and the Quarantine Quotidian, which is available um, in the journal Big Data and Society, and it is open access, and you can grab that. Thank you all for your time today. Thank you for having Thank us. you so much. Thank you. Stay healthy, everyone. We'll see you tomorrow, five o'clock.